Life Audio. And the second you clench your hands down, you might feel like you're holding on to it. it. It's been my experience. It starts to feel like sand. It starts slipping. The harder you hold it, the more it, if you clench sand, it starts to pour out. And when you have your hands open, then yes, you can receive things. And the scary part is God can then take things away. But if you have your hands clenched, it's harder, right? When God starts pulling that thing out. And it's more painful. It's more painful. And you can't receive what he wants to give you, the new thing. Welcome to the Faith Over Fear podcast, where we discover powerful truths to quiet anxiety, big and small. We're passionate about helping God's children discover and experience soul deep freedom. And we want to inspire you to share that freedom with others. We'd love to connect with you online or to speak at your next event. Visit our show notes to learn how to connect with us. Jennifer Slattery. And if Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and peace is a gift from the Holy Spirit, which both are true, then our experience of peace increases as we connect with Christ. And I suspect many, if not most of us, want a deep, ever deepening relationship with Christ and to experience peace and confidence through that. But that level of spiritual intimacy often comes with a cost a cost that can challenge our sense of security and control can leave us feeling unsettled. And But yet, according to, to scripture, it's only through Christ that we experience true and lasting joy. And today I've invited Mike Donahue, lead singer from 10th Avenue North, to talk about, I've invited him on the show to talk about the challenges and the benefits of, quote, letting go for dear life, which happens to be the name of his latest release. Mike, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Mike Donahue has seen his fair share of the unexpected following a potentially fatal car crash as a teen. Mike learned to play the guitar while still in bed recovering from his injuries. Learning the guitar quickly gave birth to songwriting, and that songwriting quickly led to the formation of a band. And that band, 10th Avenue North, became one of the most loved and successful artists in Christian music. At the beginning of 2020, despite widespread notoriety and a devout following, 10th Avenue North's members began to sense that they each had their own unexpected and unique roads to follow, and for a time, the band disbanded. But after spending four years home with his family, 10th Avenue North reemerged with some phenomenal, profound songs that help listeners connect more deeply with Christ. The one who tells us that we have no cause for fear. Mike, I really touched on a lot in that. We could like spend forever talking about that. But I want specifically, if you could tell us about the time when, like here you are, you have a successful ministry and it but it's also paying the bills right and right. and it just happens to be i mean there's always a numbers thing involved with music and so here you are doing your thing and all of a sudden god's like you know what i want you to set this down like lead us what that was like we always said in our band that we would never sacrifice our families on the altar of career or on the altar of ministry, or on the altar of success, because I believe failure is succeeding at the wrong things. Wow. And so we have this success-driven culture, but have we prioritized the things that are worth succeeding at correctly? You know? And I said, I don't want to succeed at a band and my marriage fall apart and my kids not know me, you know, and my wife came to me in 2019 and said, we have four daughters now pray for me. I have four daughters. And she said, I, I need you home. And I said to the guys, Hey, I need to be home. And we had already just had to two members leave in the name of, they said, I just can't tour anymore. I love it. I love being a part of this, but I need to, I need to come off the road. And The way our industry was and is, the majority of our income depended on us being away. 
And so, yeah, unknown. I I said, I have no idea how this is going to work, but we need to get off the road. Well, it's kind of amazing to me that we made that decision. And then a month later, you know, the pandemic started. I was thinking that too. Yeah. So it was kind of beautiful to not feel like I was forced into it. Wow. That I go, you know, I, I mean, I did, we had a tour that got canceled that I was hoping to actually have money from to feed my children, but it was beautiful to go into that season going, uh, we were choosing to come off the road anyway. So here we are. And, you know, then four years later, my wife said, actually, I, uh, I've had enough of you. (laughs) She, uh, she came to me last year. I I'd really kind of laid it to rest. I said, as much as I love being in this band, I'm not going to let my identity be tied to it. Like I, I am, I believe I am approved and validated before God that I don't need to do music for validation. I can do music from validation. I love that. It's a much different way to live. Yeah. And so my wife came to me last year and said, hey, the girls are all in school full time. It's a different season. I still think that you are talented to do this, called to do this. Um, I think you should give it another shot. And I went to my bandmates and said, hey, you guys want to get the band back together? And they go, no. Uh, we don't, uh, except one of my guitarists who wrote a lot of the songs with me for 10, he said, look, I'm really happy not being on the road, but I'll keep writing songs with you if you're open, from, open to that. So him and I have still been writing songs together and um, found some new guys that are loving being on the road who have different, you know, family situations who can be away and um, yeah, trying it back out. We'll see. Yeah, I love it. just said to me last night, let's give it a good two years and see how it goes. Okay, wow. So, okay, everybody listening, you better buy up all of his music now because you don't know. It's the uncertainty. (laughs) But I love it. Well, it's a a relent. I'll let you talk. I'll let you talk. No, please, please. I I would say what happens with a lot of us, you know, you're talking about anxiety on this podcast. A, A lot of us have this just very specific idea of what we think God's will for our life is supposed to be. And what I think happens is we conflate God's will for our life and God's calling on our life. So I was talking to some kids just the other day. I said, they said, when did you know that being a musician was God's will for your life? And I said, I don't. And they go, what? I go, God's, God's will for my life is, as you said, it's peace. It's joy. Uh, First Thessalonians says, this is God's will for your life to be joyful always, to pray continually, to give thanks in all circumstances. In other words, God's will for our life is not a career path. It's the posture of our heart. And it, that ought to free a lot of people up. Yeah. If you realize part of God's will for your life is to pray continually or another way to say it from the Greek is pray without ceasing. That should be a relief and a bummer because that means <laughs> part of God's will for your life is to never stop asking him what it is. Okay. But what we like to do is we go, well, I am called to be a musician. And and I think that's true. I think we're called to unique talents. But what happens is we we kind of put his will and his call together And we dead set that like this calling that I have at this moment in my life is what I'm called to do forever and always. And that's just not true. I think God calls us to different things at different seasons, because if I'm called to be a musician forever and always, then what happens if I get an accident and I tear out my vocal cords and can't sing or break my hands, can't play or get a brain injury and can't write lyrics? Have I missed God's calling on my life? It's like, no, that season of calling is over, and maybe he's walking me into a new season of calling. And and that's where people go, whoa, boo, whoa, boo, whoa, what whoa, that's where all my anxiety is. I can't figure out what God's call on my life is. And to that, I would say Frederick Beekner is immensely helpful. Uh, I probably heard this quote before, but he says, your calling is where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. In other words, if you're struggling with calling 
you're struggling with God's will for your life, good news. You don't have to figure out his will. Amen. For you. It's like joy, peace. It's the posture of your heart. It's, it's to be filled with trust. You know, that is his will for your life. Now, what he's called you to do, Beekner argues, ask two questions. And what we do in our culture and, and people is we just ask one. We say, what makes me come alive? Okay, I'm going to go do that. And then you go, but this isn't fulfilling. And I feel like a narcissist. Or you just ask, what does the world need? I'm going to go do that. I'm going to do what the world needs. And what happens? You get burnt out because you end up probably doing something you're not wired to do. But the real like sweet spot is to his will is that you keep asking and you say, what am I uniquely wired to do? What do I have unique joys? What makes me laugh? What makes me cry? What breaks my heart? Um, and how can I use that wiring in a way that actually serves the world's needs? So for me, that's like a real freedom of what's God called me to? I go, well, I'm not exactly sure. Um, I, I love to preach. Maybe I'm, am I supposed to be a pastor? Like I'm wrestling with this right now. I go, I don't know, but I do know that I love to write songs that help lift shame off of people. So it's like, I'm going to keep doing that. I go and gosh, I hate being on social media. Blah. I <laughs> right? so Especially now. <laughs> well, guess what? A year ago, I had a total shift. I go, oh, maybe I don't have to worry about getting more followers. Maybe I'll just worry about putting out content that serves the followers I already have. And guess what? Suddenly I found a lot of freedom in social media because I'm not trying to just get more followers for followers' sake. I'm going, I want to put out little thoughts that really bless people. And in some ways, people are like, well, who is this guy? And then, of course, ironically, I've gotten a lot more followers doing that. But it's created confusion because people go, are you the? Are you a singer or are you a pastor? What's what, what are you? And it's like, it's okay if it's not super concise and clear because I think God's calling – he said, here's, here's like a really beautiful thought and a really bummer of a thought at the same time. Okay. And then I'll stop talking. I'll let you. No, no, you're doing great. Uh, I love it. But that's why I'm on the podcast, right? I'm supposed to yeah. talk. Uh, Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, when I was young, I took that verse to mean, oh, God is so displeased with me because I don't have enough faith. Well, Jesus said, you just need faith the size of a mustard seed. So what if he is saying, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And by that, he means another way to say that is if you have all the answers, you can't please God. Because if you have all the answers, you can't trust. And the whole point of all this is that we learn to trust God. Like, And faith infers that there's a level of you're acting in hope, but you don't know what the outcome really is going to be. You have a, a certain hope of what it will turn out to be. Um, just, just like you can't have courage without fear. You can't have uh, faith if you have all the certainty. Yeah. Well, and I love listening to your full story, really, it's all about relationship, right? Like that's what, and knowing his character. And so I'm going to shift a bit because I, I watched one of your, it was actually a question and answer session where you talked about the last supper. And so I, for those of us, for those listening oh, yeah. who aren't, aren't familiar, the, the night that Jesus had like the last meal with the disciples and in Christ following communities, that's a really big aspect of our faith. So I'm going to have you share your discussion of that. You know, I think for a lot of American Christians, especially, at least in my experience, there's a lot of capitalism ingrained into our spirituality. And that's not all bad, but one of the things that creates a challenge is now you equate performance 
with God's pleasure. So as long as I'm growing and things are going well and we're on an upward, you know, growth paradigm, then God's happy with me. And the thing is, God wants presence with us more than he needs performance from us. Okay. And to illustrate this point, when Jesus is doing the Last Supper with the disciples, he's celebrating the Passover feast. Passover feast is a Hebrew custom where you are celebrating the time that the angel of death passed over the doorways of the people of God in the land of Egypt, and he rescued them out of Egypt through the Red Sea. You probably remember that story. Even if you're not of a faith background, you probably have heard of Moses parting from, yeah, the Yeah, from the Hollywood thing. movie, at least. Yeah, so... <laughs> The Passover feast is a feast they do once a year, and traditionally there's seven cups of wine in that feast. And scholars believe that when Jesus got to the third cup, he starts to say these words to the disciples. This is my my blood of a new covenant with you. Take and drink it. It's shocking on a couple levels. One, the rabbis weren't supposed to drink the third cup. They held it up and blessed it, and then they set it aside for the coming Messiah. So when Jesus starts to drink out of this thing and offering the disciples to drink out of it, they're going, oh, here it goes. Here comes the rat. Because they think Jesus has come to lead them in a political revolution over Rome. That's what they're hoping for. And so they start to get excited, but then Jesus drops these weird words. and says, this is my blood of a new covenant. Take and drink it. Now, we don't hear what's happening, but those words are the exact words that a groom would say when proposing to his would-be wife. So they're like, oh yeah, we're going to kill Rome. You want to marry me? (laughs) What? When a groom was going to marry a girl, he'd go to his dad, say, hey dad, I want to marry her. So they'd come up with a bride price. So they would pay a price to get the, a chance to propose. Remember Jacob and Leah and all that. There isn't, there wasn't a, definitive co- contract that she had to say yes. So some people are like, this is so archaic. It's actually kind of a beautiful, like you have to pay for the chance to propose to this girl. So he'd pay for the chance to propose and then they'd get in a room and he'd fill a cup with wine with all their relatives watching and say, this is my covenant with you. Take and drink it. If she didn't want to, she could slide it away and say, no man, you smell like a camel. Or she could take the cup and drink it signifying she's saying I do. At which point, She'd go to her town, he'd go to his town, and they wouldn't see each other again until the day they got married. What was she doing? She was keeping watch. She didn't know when the day or the time or the hour would be that he would come and marry her. So she would just be preparing for the wedding day. Meanwhile, she wouldn't be called by her name. She'd be called one who was bought with a price. The only way they could communicate was through the best man. He was the groomsman, the he would take messages from him to her. He's like a like an archaic text messenger, you know, going back and forth. What's the dude doing? He is preparing a mansion for his bride. Now, I'm getting to a point here. If you're like, where is this going? He's preparing a mansion. In that time, the the Hebrew people would build insulas in their town. And the insula was a family dwelling that each generation would build a new extension or addition onto, which was called a mansion. So mansion means apartment in Aramaic. And he didn't get to decide when it was finished. He'd have to work on it every day and look to his dad and say, hey, dad, is it done? Hey, dad, is it done? Hey, dad, is it done? And then finally, his dad would look at the apartment and he'd say, it's finished. You can go. And marry your girl. So he'd get his groomsmen. They'd come into her town with shofars, blowing shofar horns. And she'd run down the aisle and they'd get married and make little rabbis and live happily ever after. Now, the reason I say all that is so that you, whoever's listening, might start connecting the symbology that we don't usually get. Right? So Jesus says, this is my covenant of the new blood. Will you marry me? At which point... Jesus says to the disciples, hey, I got to go away for a while. You're not going to see me, but while we're apart in this engagement period, your name has changed. You are one who is bought with a price. And don't worry, though we're not going to see each other face to face, I'm going to send my best man, the Holy Spirit, to communicate between me and you. What am I doing? Well, I'm going to my father's house where there's many 
mansions, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. Now, I don't know the day, the time, or the hour. Only the Father in heaven gets to decide that. But you need to keep watch because you don't know the day or the time or the hour either. So keep watch. The day is going to come like a thief in the night until one day when my Father says, green light, the day has come. Gather your posse, and I'm going to get my groomsmen, the holy angels, and they're going to blow their shofars, the four trumpets from the four corners of the earth, and I'm going to bring you home for the marriage supper of the Lamb. So I say all that to say there are those who think that Jesus is offering just another set of religious guidelines for us to follow. And if any of that symbology is true, I just see Jesus offering something entirely different. That He is offering intimacy and presence with us. That his very life would be flowing through us and that we are not just children, we're not just servants, we're not just friends. We're actually called the bride of Christ. That's beautiful. Especially, I know, so a lot of our listeners actually have come from developmental trauma. And so hearing that that Jesus is wanting to teach them to receive his love and really rest in that, I think, is really powerful. I wanted to shift a bit since we're talking about experiencing peace. And again, from something you said, I'm going to borrow from <laughs> from uh, a little mini sermon, I guess you say. I think it was Colossians 3.15 where okay. you broke down, let the peace of Christ rule in your peace of God, whatever, rule in your heart. I would love... For those who are saying, and and now this actually is a conversation for those who have gotten to know Jesus personally, right? Like Mm -hmm. when, once we come to know him and if we're like, well, I'm not feeling peaceful, what, what would you say? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a lot of reasons you could not feel peaceful, Um, True, but one of the things that we could talk about is in Colossians, it says, let the peace of God rule in your heart. Now. Just maybe close your eyes and picture this. It's kind of the same picture Jesus says in Revelation 3. He says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone lets me in, I will eat with him. Right? And so there's this permission that God is asking us for, which is different than permission to peace is different than acquisition to peace. Achievement to peace. Right? So instead of thinking, okay, peace is something I have to work to get to think of it as I'm standing at a door and God's peace wants to come in. So then it's not, how can I achieve peace? It's how am I actively resisting peace? You know, like sometimes I think about the resentments we have toward people that we're actually probably putting more effort into resenting them than it actually would be to forgive them. Not always. I don't want to minimize, minimize, the difficulty of forgiveness, but sometimes just say, how am I actively resisting God's peace? And, and one of the ways we do that is in our imagination. I had a therapist friend. He said, one of the most helpful things I can advise people struggling with anxiety is to use that imagination that you're using to create all the worst case scenarios in your head. Use that imagination constructively as well, because that takes actually a lot of creativity in your brain. So you're doing a lot of work. So put some of that work of building toward anxiety. Say, what would it look like if it all worked out? What would it, what would it happen if everything worked out the way that I want it? So just match your creative energy of constructive future as much as you're considering a destructive one. Yeah. Well, I'm going to give a plug back to your music because I've I've shared on this podcast before, but science has shown, brain science has shown, if we engage in seven minutes of worship a day, we actively rewire our brain. And so, isn't that amazing? That's so powerful. And when you're listening to songs that speak truth and you're singing it, so you're actively rewiring your brain while you're also connecting with the Prince of Peace. So I would, let's, let's talk about, because it's beautiful, let's talk about your song, Letting Go for Dear Life. I mean, yeah. when you originally would, you originally picture like the title and you're, you see like maybe somebody clinging to some kind of rope or something over, over a cliff, but, but tell us a little bit more about that song. Yeah. Just to play on words. You know, you think so long about, I'm just holding on for dear life. You know, I'm just, 
I'm just trying to hang in there and make it happen. And again, failure is succeeding at the wrong things. And I go, you know, what if the best thing you can do is give up the illusion of control? You know, what if life is actually waiting once you let go of control, not when you try to gain more of it? And for for me, I wrote that song when we decided to come back as a band because I knew I would be misunderstood. I knew people would make up stories about why did the band end? Did we fail? Why were you a solo artist? Why did you stop being a solo artist? Why did you? And, and I go, dude, I got to let go. When you let go of the need to be understood, like there is a freedom in being misunderstood. I'm not saying we shouldn't care to articulate things clearly. Um, but as far as I can tell, Jesus was misunderstood all the time. And he really let go of his reputation to do what God called him to do. I mean, think about him hanging on the cross. Like, if you're really the son of God, you need to come down off that cross. Well, he had to let go of reputation and what people misunderstood he was doing to do the will of the Lord. And so there's a freedom there. And man, I, I've I've loved singing that song because it just it like you said, it, it feels like it rewires my heart and my brain because I need to be reminded of that every day that I'm not really as in control as I like to think that I am. Yeah, well, and I think your story is a really good example of the father's heart, right? Like he was preemptively guiding you before COVID. He gave you this period of rest, which so yeah. as as we kind of close up, well, let me finish my, my sentence, but then I yeah. want to go back to that period of rest. And then it's like after you're kind of, filled and you know your family is filled all and so then you can yep. you can serve again from a place of fullness so talk to me about what that those four years did in your soul i mean i think in the best ways it detached a lot of the entanglement of identity that i had in what i did um as much as we like to think, I know I'm not what I do. I am what has been done for me, right? That's what I would argue is the beautiful freedom in Christ. But he really gave me the opportunity to let that really seep in, right? Like no one's applauding for me to come up on stage. Nobody's impressed when they, oh, you're in 10th Avenue North, you know? 10th Avenue North is gone. And in a lot of ways, I feel like I, we just did a string of festivals, you know, this summer coming back and played a lot of shows with old friends and other bands. And they just said, man, I don't know what happened to you the last four years, but there's just like more weight and more joy at the same time when you were on stage. What do you and mean by weight? If you could, I think steady mm. on my own two feet. You know what I'm saying? Like you're standing up very confident of what it is you have to say and why you're there. So more and, presence through his presence. Yeah, absolutely. And more purpose. You know, when you when you have something taken away, when it's given back to you, you see a lot more gift and purpose in it. When, you know, for a while you can get caught in the just the spin cycle. This is do it. We're doing this because this is what we're doing it. Well, then you step away and you go, oh, no, oh, right. That's why I did that. And uh, so you get to come back with renewed purpose, renewed presence, um, and renewed peace. So the relinquishing, maybe even for those listening, like if it feels really hard, it can actually lead to a precious gift is what I'm hearing. It's not like a loss. It fe might feel like a loss, but it actually is a gain. The only way you can hold something rightly, I believe, as finite humans in limited time and space who are, we believe, are being invited into a relationship with an eternal creator. The only right way to hold anything, if my life is temporary and everything I have is a gift, that's what we're told in scripture, what do you have that you did not receive? The only way to rightly hold anything is like this. Yeah. And for those listening with open I'm holding hands. my palms open. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And the second you clench your hands down, 
you might feel like you're holding on to it. it it's been my experience. It starts to feel like sand. It starts slipping. The harder you hold it, the more it, if you hold sand like this, it'll sit there. If you clench sand, it starts to pour out through your fingers, right? And when you have your hands open, then yes, you can receive things. And the scary part is God can then take things away. But if you have your hands clenched, it's harder, right? When God starts pulling that thing out. It's and more painful. It's more painful. And you can't receive what he wants to give you, the new thing. You know, so just trying to live my life with open hands to let go or receive whatever it is that God's wanting to do. Yeah. Well, that reminds me of what Jesus said. If you if you try to hold your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose it for my sake, you'll gain it. Thank you so much for joining us. This was a really powerful, encouraging conversation. I look forward to hearing more great songs from you and your band and spending some time this week jamming out to letting go for dear life. It's so, so good. And to our listeners, make sure to visit the show notes for direct links to his music. And I love that you are addressing shame and doing it through increased experience of Jesus Christ. That's that's beautiful. That undoes shame quicker yeah. than anything else that I've found. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for listening. I hope this episode inspired you to connect more deeply and consistently with Jesus Christ, knowing that he is always, always leading us towards greater freedom. If you haven't already done so, I encourage you to subscribe. Then you won't miss a single episode and share it with your friends and your family. I would also be encouraged if you would rate it. That helps others to find it. And until next time, May you live as one who truly has been set free.